Rabo owns and operates Rabo Farms in southeastern Wyoming. The farm is certified organic operation and raises wheat, porcel millet, garbanzo beans, lentils, yellow peas, and was recently recognized by Farm Journal Media as one of the three nationwide finalists for top producer of the year. Rabo also speaks nationwide on various topics involving agriculture and is an author and a past radio host. He's a graduate from University of Wyoming and resides in his farm near Al Albion, Wyoming with his wife and three sons. Can please everyone give me a round of applause, help Ron come in. I, I, I do actually. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna talk in this one first. All right, how's everyone doing? Okay, we got two or three that are pretty happy. You guys got a free meal, how good is that? Right? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to, uh, I think we've got a mic here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch around some microphones, and the, uh, the lovely ladies here from uh, Henrik's Trading Company are going to help me. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to say that, uh, Phil, you put on a great event, you have wonderful people that work for you, and I think that they all deserve a round of applause for the great job they have done this evening. All right, so I'm going to uh, see if I can try to make this crazy thing work. So, um, my guy back there, Jeff, said that this thing is pretty sensitive. I think he was right about that. All right, so if I use this, can you hear me? Okay, everyone can hear me with this? We're good to go? All right, so here's what we've got going on here this evening, okay? So, I figured the best way for us to set up this evening, all right, since we've all learned probably more than we ever wanted to know about worms and maggots, okay? I thought we'd maybe change the subject a little bit. No, don't, okay, so face, face down, so don't read this yet. You guys are just ahead of the game a little bit. Stop being so ambitious. Okay, so the ladies are handing out a piece of paper. All right, so what you're going to do is you're going to leave that face down. All right, where were my people that were looking? Oh, someone in this row right here. So <clears throat> I figured that there's no better way to start this conference with, my, with, with what I'm going to talk about than to give you all a little bit of a quiz. How does that sound? Right? Does that sound good? Okay, if you're excited, say I'm excited. Excellent. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to be clearing my throat a ton because I managed to catch a case of laryngitis, I guess, this weekend, and I couldn't even talk two days ago. So if I start sounding like Darth Vader at the end of the night, then that's why. Okay. So raise your hand if you got a pen. Okay. Everyone got a free pen, right, in your packet. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. Okay. This is an individual activity only. Okay. You can't look at your neighbor. Okay. You've got to keep your eyes on your own paper, okay? Does everyone understand? Phil, you got it? Okay. You're going to keep your eyes on your own paper. Okay, I'm going to give you two minutes to complete the questions on this quiz, okay? Then we're going to go through it. And I got great prizes, okay, for the people who are successful in, uh, in, in answering the questions. So, are we ready? Yes. If we're ready, say, yes, I'm ready. Yes. Okay, go. Flip it over. Here we go. Raise your hand if you don't know how to read and you need someone to read those for you. All right, we're about the halfway mark.
Okay, how are we doing? You got about 15 seconds left. You all are a little bit, you're a little bit more sharper than the average crew. Which isn't saying much. That's true. All right. Okay, put the, put the pens down. All right, how do we do? We do pretty good? Everyone's feeling better about themselves? Okay, well, I'm, gonna, I'm about ready to make you feel better. Okay, so it's all, it's all going to be fine. So, all right, let's see here. Let's see what the first question is. All right, first question. Okay, we're going to go with, uh, okay, on which side of a cup is it best to have the handle and don't just shout out the answer. You got to raise your hand if you think you know the answer. And what's your name? Bob. <laughs> right. Everyone's name's going to be Bob tonight. I get it. I see how this game is played. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, Bob. <laughs> on uh, on what side? Right. On the right. Because who? How many of you in here are right-handed? Yeah. So how many people said right? Okay, my son's left-handed, so how many people said left? Yeah, right? <clears throat> well, you're both wrong. Yeah. Doesn't it doesn't matter. It's, it's actually the outside. Because on a cylinder, there is no side. There's only an inside and an outside. Okay? All right, well, let's, let's see if number two is a little bit better for you. Okay, where do the biggest potatoes grow? This ought to be obvious. Bob, what's your answer? Idaho. Idaho. Duh, right? I mean, we're right here. Who said Idaho? Yeah, see, all chickens now. No one wants to raise their hand. <clears throat> Actually, the answer is in the ground. That's where the biggest potatoes grow. Okay, all right. Number three. Oh, yeah, everyone gets this one. Okay, what living thing has only one foot? Hmm. What living thing has only one foot? Someone's going to say it. I know they are. Just, okay, raise your hand. What is it? This is the first time in a room full of people that I've had two answers and they're the same and they're a clam. So the last time I saw a clam walking around on the beach in his feet, with his shoes on, right? All right, so who wrote snail? Everyone writes a snail. You wrote a snail, didn't you? <clears throat> Does anyone have any other answers to this one? That's close. Okay, what living thing has only one foot? A leg. A leg. That's not that hard, right? All right, number three, what are we, or number four? Okay, would you rather a tiger attack you or a lion? Neither one of them. But you got to make a choice. So what's it going to be? Tiger? Who said a tiger? Okay, who said a lion? Okay, now, <clears throat> how many of you are confused and couldn't even read the question? That would be the rest of you that didn't raise your hands. So let me ask the question again. <clears throat> Would you rather a tiger attack you or a lion? See, there we go. All right, <clears throat> moving on. This is for the ladies. Where are all men equally good looking? Come on, ladies, you got this. Right? Where are all men equally good looking? What was, what was your answer? In the dark. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Moving on. All right. Number six. Okay. What do we have here? Number six says, if it took eight men, 10 hours to build a wall, how long would it take four men to build it? Easy math. Who said 20? Okay. So there were more than three of you that said 20. I've been walking around, right? Okay. Well, actually it wouldn't take any time at all because the wall's already built. Okay. All right. Man, you, who is 100% so far? Bob. I thought 
thought I was in a room full of a bunch of farmers. You guys ought to be smarter than that. Okay, which would you prefer to have, an old $10 bill or a new one? A new one. You got that right. Who said a new one? Who said an old one? <clears throat> Let me ask the question again. Which would you prefer to have, an old $10 bill or a new one? Ah, of course. For goodness sakes. All right. Okay. So if you had, if you had three apples and four oranges in one hand and four apples and three oranges in the other hand, what would you have? This is obvious. Big hands. Yeah, you just have big hands. That's all. Okay. That one's really easy. Even the people in Washington and Idaho can answer that one. Okay. How can a man go eight days without sleep? By not sleeping, true. How can a man go eight days without sleep? Do we know? No, we don't know. For real. Well, he sleeps at night. It's not that hard, right? All right, what do we got here? Okay, last question. Divide 20 by half and add 10. What's the answer? <coughs> do we know what it is? Who said 20? Oh, there's more than two of you that said 20. Who said 50? 50 is correct. <clears throat> because taking 20 and dividing it by half is the same, time as, same thing as timesing it times 2. Because you're dividing it by 0.5. Okay? All right, so how many 100 percenters? <clears throat> Do I have any 100 percenters? <clears throat> well, I got a, I've got a prize over here. Um... Believe it or not, it's going to go to Bob. <clears throat> and Bob gets the prize for creativity this evening. All right. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> how many of you have been to uh, the wonderful state of Wyoming? <clears throat> so, okay, let me see the raise of hands again. Seriously, that many people have been to Wyoming? Why? <laughs> like, did you go to Yellowstone Park? I mean, is that where you did... Someone told me earlier he was in Laramie. Yeah, okay. Laramie, go Pokes, right? Okay, Cougars. Ah, oh, for goodness sakes. Okay, so, so I'm from the great state of Wyoming. And uh, when people think about Wyoming, this is what they picture, right? Because, I mean, this is, we're going to go to Yellowstone Park. We're going to go to Devil's Tower, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is where I live. That's in Wyoming. Yep. So y'all think you have it hard here. This was a day that I took outside of my office um, and the wind was blowing 93 miles an hour. Yeah, you think you have hard wind here? Yeah, you really don't have hard wind here. But one of the great things that I love about Wyoming, so when people come to Wyoming, um, a lot of times, you know, they stay in some of our great, you know, motels, things like that. So I love it when... Um, when people stay in a hotel and they call down at the clerk in Wyoming and they say, hey, I've got a leak in my sink. And I love it when the desk clerk just replies back and says, go ahead. <laughs> <clears throat> so that only happens in Wyoming. And those of you who didn't get that will maybe get it on the way home. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is, uh, these are things that you will never hear a Wyomingite say. So what do you call someone from Washington? Is it a... Washingtonian? Man, I'm glad I'm from Wyoming because I can't even say that word. Okay, so things you'll never hear a Wyomingite say. I'll take Shakespeare for a thousand, Alex. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> you can't feed that to the dog. All right, now things that you will hear a Wyomingite say, mostly because I'm the one who invented these two. That was a fun evening. <clears throat> I don't remember most of it, um, but I think that we were using two things that we probably shouldn't have in combination. Um, and here's my favorite saying. <laughs> That's what I love the most. <clears throat> you know, they, they all have a purpose, you know. I mean, every animal serves a purpose, right? And some of those purposes are just targets. And that's okay. <clears throat> so, uh, 
And so a little bit of history about Wyoming. So um, those of you who have been to Wyoming know that it's really just like, um, uh, it's, it's part of the old Wild West, right? So my grandfather saved all kinds of newspaper clippings. And so since his passing, I've been going through all of these uh, totes and things like that that he has. And one of the things that I really loved was this article that I found that he saved from some random newspaper. It's about the two bar 70 relate story of rowdy days in Cheyenne in 1867. So I won't read you the whole thing, but uh, the bottom of this says uh, every nation on the globe was represented and the principal pastime was gambling, drinking Bob wire lightning, which I have no idea what that is, and shooting, probably cats. <clears throat> So uh, Cheyenne had 6,000 inhabitants and the rougher element were stealing anything from anybody. Daily and nightly amusements were knockdowns and robberies. The more respectable residents got tired of these depredations on property and life and formed a vigilance committee. So Judge Lynch held court from which there were neither appeals nor stays in execution. No gallows was erected because telegraph poles and the Crow Creek Bridge were easy of access. <laughs> right? So if we don't, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a wild west, right? So if we don't like the way you behave, then it's all good. We'll just hang you, okay? Unless you're a cat and then we'll just shoot you. So then that's fine too. So incidentally, my roots actually go uh, pretty deep in Wyoming. So my, uh, my great, great grandparents migrated from the Midwest, which I, I still don't understand. Why would you go to Wyoming if you live in the Midwest, right? If you're in Iowa and Illinois, why the hell would you go to Wyoming? But they did. So they, uh, assuming, I'm presuming that they hopped on a, on a, uh, uh, a covered wagon or, or what, what not, and they went to Cheyenne. And my great-great-grandfather was a stonemason, and he helped build the Capitol building and this building, which is the uh, original Union Pacific train depot, which still stands in Cheyenne. And uh, uh, they were very ambitious. They were involved in real estate. They worked at the Cheyenne Steam Laundry. Um, they had different businesses in town. But my great grandfather, and, or my great great grandfather and great great grandmother's dream was to really own a cattle ranch. So in the early 1900s, when my great great grandfather passed away, my great great grandmother moved further east into the southeastern corner of Wyoming, which is where we're at now, um, over by the great metropolis of Alban, population 120. Um, now. Um, and that's where they homesteaded their land. And so they began to build their business. And my great grandfather began to build his ranch. He sold quarter horses um, actually all over the United States and clear into Europe. He was really big into horses and into cattle. And so the, uh, the, the, the period of time where, where he built this property in Wyoming, you know, it was homesteaded. So we homesteaded in 1905. My great, great grandmother also homesteaded some property. And there were some interesting facts that happened during those times. You know, my, my great grandfather used to uh, tell stories uh, to my grandfather who then relayed them to us about the cattle rustlers who would come and he, they would have to carry guns. And in fact, I have that pistol and have that, uh, that holster that he still carried around uh, back in those days. And you know, when I was digging around in my grandfather's things, I found this. So uh, this is one of my favorites. Two farmers fight when one impounds 40 stray hogs. <clears throat> yeah, so George Raybo and Samuel Haldeman, farmers living in the Alban district west of Kimball, Nebraska, were both injured in a fight caused by Haldeman impounding at his farm a drove of 40 hogs which belonged to Raybo. So here's what's so great about this. You can tell the writing in the English is just different in those days, right? <clears throat> Haldeman was hurt in the fistic encounter and Raybo is confined to his home with gunshot wounds inflicted, according to police, by Haldeman after Raybo beat him up. <laughs> ah, that makes me kind of proud. Uh, Rabo was shot in the leg and chest with a shotgun. Haldeman has been arrested. Rabo will recover, according to advices had from his home Sunday. So, as you can tell from, you know, I'm presuming that this was the mid, you know, 1900, say that was the, maybe the 1930s or so. Uh, maybe in 100 years, things hadn't changed that much from the Cheyenne days when they lynched people. And maybe it just went from lynching to just shooting people. Um, I don't know. So, so nonetheless, uh, my family has been in southeastern Wyoming for over 100 years. And the ranch that I grew up on was actually my grandfather, my father, um, my father's two cousins. My grandpa's brother uh, drank himself to death in the 1960s. Um, this is actually a picture um, of my grandfather, my father, and myself. I'm looking good there on my horse, Peanuts. 
<coughs> peanuts was kind of a pain. But, uh, but you know, the, the ranch that I grew up on was, uh, I loved my grandfather and I loved my father. My father just, you know, how many of you have kids in here? Did, have they, are they teenagers or have they gone past that stage? You know, did, I never remember, like I always heard these stories about how teenagers will grow up and they'll hate their parents. And, and I never actually remember going through that stage. I mean, I just really loved my parents. I, I, my dad was my best friend. I mean, he's the one that I <clears throat> did everything with. He was my confidant. He was the one that I, um, you know, went hunting with. He was the one that I told jokes to. He was the one that I, you know, worked with at the ranch. And my grandfather was really no different. And they were what I would call not necessarily cowboys, but they were gentlemen ranchers. You know, and there's, there's a big difference between the two, especially when you come from, you know, the wild state of Wyoming. And so, uh, so as I grew up, um, I was very attached to, you know, these, these two gentlemen here. And, but, you know, we had, a, we had a compound on our place is what I always called it. You know, there are four houses there and everyone lived next to each other. And, and I don't know how many of you are in that same predicament, but it can sometimes be a little bit less than fun. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that was, that was, really not good in our, in our operation was that our operation was not big enough. Okay. Our operation, we, we had four families living off of our operation and we had about 300 head of cows and those four families lived off of those 300 head of cows. And we had a couple hundred acres of, of uh, crop, which mind you is in Wyoming, not in Iowa. So it's not that much. Okay. And so, um, so the most that I ever remember my dad making when, uh, when I was growing up was $600 a month. And that's what he raised us on. And we had old, old equipment. Like we had 1940s and 1950s and 1960s equipment. And this is in the 80s when I was being raised and in the 90s. And, uh, but you know, that's, that, that was just what we did. I mean, we just worked all the time and we took care of things and, uh, and we were trying to carry on the family tradition of ranching. And so <clears throat> my dad and I had had these discussions that if I ever wanted to be part of the family ranch, that what I needed to do was go away, get my college education, go out in the world and then try to get a job. And then at some point, you know, if, if we could make things work, that I would come back to the ranch. So, um, I was working, um, this was in, uh, see, 1999. I was working uh, for the Wyoming FFA Foundation. So I was the executive director of the FFA Foundation. I was doing all their PR and all their fundraising and really loved that organization. I was really involved with the National FFA Organization at the time. And uh, my dad had called me and he said, would you come home and help wean cows for a couple of days? So I said, sure, took a couple of days off of work and came home. And um, November 4th, 1999, I never will forget the day. And uh, I was filling a vaccine gun <clears throat> and uh, I heard a noise behind me and I turned around and my dad was laying on the ground and I, and I went up to him and, and I put, I, I knelt next to him and I, I, I put my hand under his head and, and I said, it's okay. And it's like, he opened his mouth. Like he was trying to tell me something. And I said, it's, it's okay. Just everything will be all right. And his head went lax and his face turned blue. And his cousin and I drug him out of the alleyway and we gave CPR on my dad. And I never will forget the moment that I was doing chest compressions on my father. And I was 26 years old and I really didn't know where I wanted to go with my life. I really didn't know what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be when I grew up. And it's like all these dreams of the things that he and I had talked about in life. It's like they disappeared. And the ambulance came and we were still doing CPR and then they started. And I remember one moment that both of the paramedics just looked at me and I was screaming at them. And I just said, you got it. You got to try to do something. And we loaded them in the ambulance and. That night was the absolute longest night of my entire life. And the next day, my mom and my sister and I decided that we would take my father off of life support because the, the doctor said that he was probably gone before he hit the ground. And so the life that I knew 
in this ranching community and all the great things we had done and all the great aspirations I had for my life were gone. And I honestly didn't know how I was going to be able to function. Like, how was I going to be able to move on and get past this event? And I remember I quit my job and I bought my dad's shares to get back into the ranch. And I was living in Cheyenne, which is a 50 mile one way drive. And, and I would stop about five miles out and I was crying my eyeballs out and I have to collect myself every single day so I could show up so I could go to work in an environment that I was no longer welcome in. You see, my dad was the hub of our entire operation. He made everything work. Everyone came to our house every morning and they said, Ed, what do we need to do today? And my dad would instruct everyone what they needed to do and they would go do it. He was the businessman, he was the financial manager, he was the mechanic, he was the cow man, and he was the farmer. My grandfather was in his 80s, and so he had become less active as time had moved on, and my dad's two cousins were basically hired hands. But now that my father was gone, the wolves came out. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I always tell people, if you want to know what a family ranch is like, pick the relatives in your family that hate you the most, go into business with them, and live next door. Seriously, that's what it's like, right? Some of you have been there. I remember uh, my grandfather got very sick. And it was three years after my dad passed away that both of my grandparents passed away just a matter of a couple of months apart from each other. And I think they died of a broken heart because it was their only son. And I remember changing my grandpa's pants and feeding him and still managing my duties at the ranch and driving up to the ranch and having my partners say, you taking care of your grandpa is taking a lot of time away from this ranch. You know, if I were you, I'd forget about him. He never did any good for anyone around here. Because all of a sudden, now power's important. Now money's important. Now authority's important. And I had to take a long, hard look at myself. And I had to say, is this the kind of environment <clears throat> that I want to raise my children in? Is this the kind of environment that I want to have a happy marriage in? Is this the kind of environment that I want to, to try to fulfill my vision for my own life? And so after four years of getting beat up and, and trying to share ideas and getting shot down, I committed the ultimate sin in production agriculture. And I broke up the family ranch. And I was 30 years old when I left. And I was by myself. And it became the rest of the Rabo family against Ron. And my wife and I decided that anything was better than what, what we were experiencing. Because I firmly believe that we live in the freest and the greatest country that the world has ever known. And I will be damned if I will not learn to realize my own potential. And you can't live and realize your own potential when you're held down, when you're under duress all the time. And for me, it was worth losing everything just so I could step away and try to become something. And it was a tough decision because my dad passed away out of order according to our operating agreements. So if I left, I was gonna lose a big portion of what I would get to keep if I just stayed. And I left anyway. And so my wife and I struggled for four more years after that. And we had spent almost everything that we had. And we had old equipment that was about ready to go. And I remember listening to a guy in our, our local cafe and he said, it's an older gentleman. And he said, man, if I just have one tractor breakdown, I'll go broke. And I thought, man, that's me. So my wife and I talked about it and I said, well, I'll just go back to school. I'll get my teaching degree. 
So I enrolled in Chadron State College and uh, started on my teaching degree. And I took two months of courses and I said, dear God, if I have to talk about my feelings one more time, someone's going to die. <laughs> so I decided that that was not like the best path for me. So we took a long, hard look at our business and we said, you know what, if we're going to own a business and we're going to be farmers, which we didn't know how to do because I was a cowman, we're going to have to think outside the box. So what we did is we looked at all of our assets. We looked at it as our business, not as a lifestyle, not as an heirloom, but we looked at our business as a business. For the first time in Rainbow history, we looked at it as a business. And we sold almost 90% of everything that we owned. And we started over. And we started over with equipment and facilities and storage facilities and our home and our land. And we've done that over the last 10 years. This is our place. When we started, that was where my grandparents lived for 62 years. And those outlying buildings that you see, uh, the one on the right was not even attached to the footers anymore, the walls. And so you could watch it blow in the Wyoming wind. <clears throat> and so over the last 10 years, we built our farm. We discovered the organic industry. And it's a niche industry. You see, we're really on the fringe of being able to make it in production agriculture where I live. We get 14 inches of rain a year. Most of that comes from October through March when we don't need it. And most of it comes sideways, okay? And we farm a 5,300 feet elevation in addition. So it's tough. So when I discovered that I had an opportunity to grab a hold of a niche market, I thought, why would I not do that? Why would I not understand, or at least learn, begin to learn to understand where consumers were and meet consumers where they, where, where they want, what they wanted, produce what they wanted. <clears throat> so over the last 10 years, we've changed our place and this is what it looks like today. We put a lot of work into it. We put a lot of heartache into it. And uh, it's a wonderful place for us to raise our children. But here's what I discovered. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, is that many of us who are involved in agriculture are struggling just to make ends meet. When times are good, they're really good. But when times are bad and the value of crops is not there, the value of cattle is not there, and the price of our inputs is going sky high, it's really tough to make ends meet. <clears throat> and I discovered that for myself that it's really hard to focus on getting better and it's really hard to focus on improving yourself, your operation, and your land if all you're doing is wallowing in an economic struggle all the time. <clears throat> and along came my discovery of these two words, relationships matter. So a few years back, <clears throat> I decided that instead of just only growing wheat, we should try some other crops because the organic standards are that we have to use, you know, different rotating crops. And I thought, well, we need to see if we can improve our soil structure. We need to see if we can diversify what we're doing, see if we can develop a little bit more revenue on our place. And so uh, we began to look into this, uh, this chickpea thing. <clears throat> and so I'm like going to confess my ignoramus side here. I didn't even know what a chickpea was. I thought, are those those gross beans that are in a salad bar that no one eats? <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, that's what they are, right? <clears throat> so a buddy of mine said, uh, you need to call this, uh, this Phil Henricks guy. So I called him up and I said, I'm thinking about growing chickpeas. And uh, he talked my ear off. And um, I hung up the phone and I thought, who is this clown? <laughs> Seriously, who is this guy trying to convince me to grow chickpeas in Wyoming, right? On the high desert. And so uh, <clears throat> I was dumb, so I decided that, well, I'll try it. So Phil sent me a contract, and uh, he said, I'm going to send you some seed. And I said, okay, this is how many acres I'm going to plant. And he said, this is how many pounds I want you to plant. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and um, I said, okay. So the semi shows up. It's got way more seed on it than what I need. And I thought, hmm. 
So the clown now sent me more seed than what I need. What am I going to do? Send it back to Washington? I'm in Wyoming, right? So I call up Phil and I say, um, yeah, I got way more seed than what I need here. And he says, no, you'll be fine. I want you to plant, I want you to plant more pounds per acre. Sure you do. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good, Phil. <laughs> and uh, he said, here's what I want you to plant them. You need to stay in touch with me. You need to let me know what's going on with this. Because we need to do this right. And I said, okay, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. So I guess, you know, any advice is probably good advice at this point. So I'm getting ready to plant. <clears throat> Phil says, call me before you plant. So I call him and he said, no, I don't want you to plant yet. Don't plant yet. Call me in another couple of weeks. So I call him in another couple of weeks. No, I don't want you to plant yet. And <clears throat> by the way, I want you to plant more pounds per acre. Of course you do, because I'm not out of seed yet. Right? So uh, anyway, finally comes down to it. We finally get to planting our garbanzos in June. And all my neighbors planted theirs beginning of April. Right? <clears throat> and uh, I didn't think the chickpeas uh, came up very good. Phil sent his crop consultant out. We looked at them. And then pretty soon one day, this red Dodge Charger shows up in my yard and it's Phil. The bright green cap for me with HTC on it. And we talked and we talked chickpeas. <clears throat> he said, no, you need to let me know. Your chickpeas look really good. You need to let me know when you're going to harvest them. So I call him up. I have a hunting and guiding business. So we do elk, antelope, and mule deer hunts the whole month of October. So I'm super busy in October. And, uh, uh, I tell Phil, I say, we got a snow coming, so I'm going to swat these things. He goes, don't you dare swat those. Don't you dare do that. Ron, I'm telling you that those things will not ripen if you swat them. I said, but they're going to get snowed on. Nah, that'll be fine. <laughs> okay, Phil. So another couple of weeks go by, snow melts. I send him pictures. He says, nah, there's too much green in them. I said, well, we got another snow coming. Nah, that'll be fine. So another couple of weeks goes by. I sent him another picture and he said, yeah, you could probably go in and harvest them. So we go in and harvest them. Guess who raised the best garbanzo crop that Laramie County's ever seen? Rabo Farms did. And you know why Rabo Farms did? Because Rabo Farms listened to Phil Henricks. And this year, we planted our garbanzos again in June. And all the conventional farmers were coming to my place and asking, asking me, how can we raise clean, weedless, organic garbanzo fields? And my answer is, Phil's the man. He knows what he's doing. Relationships matter. You see, <clears throat> in turbulent times that we have in agriculture frequently, Relationships are everything. Communication is everything. And you know why it's everything? Because effective communication and good solid relationships build trust. And when times are tough, the only thing that you have as a producer is to trust the people that you work with. See, I think that we're making a huge mistake in production agriculture. The huge mistake that I think that we're making is that we are all so fiercely independent that we refuse to work together. You see, every, everywhere I go and talk about the organic industry, I always have some conventional farmer telling me why that's not a sustainable model for, for agriculture. Why does it matter? I don't care if you're a conventional farmer. Maybe it's not sustainable for you to spray all the time. I don't know. Do we really need to have those discussions? Or do we need to have the discussions of, hey, we're all involved in production agriculture and it's tough. How do we get better at understanding where the processors are coming from, <clears throat> where, the, where the, the, the distributors are coming from, where the retailers are coming from, and how about we all combine our efforts together and get on the same page and share the same message instead of being so divided all the time. 
We've got a powerful industry. We feed the entire, every living creature on this planet gets fed by a farmer or a rancher. They get fed by someone who's involved in production agriculture. That's a massive responsibility. We've been given this, this gift to take care of creation on this earth. And we're too busy worried about the little tiny boxes that we live in to even communicate with each other. I love this quote. <clears throat> Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. <clears throat> Here's why that, that resonates with me. You ever had the... Uh, the partners or the uh, relatives say, <clears throat> yeah, we need to do this, but you know, here's why we can't. I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have enough money. We don't have the right ground. We don't get enough rain. You know, there's lots of excuses out there. But until you actually do something, until you actually do it for yourself, until you actually put something in action, Nothing happens. Because I always tell my kids that people will do what they want to do, but only if they want to do it bad enough. And people will have an opinion about anything until it affects them. And you notice how those opinions change as soon as it begins to affect them. <clears throat> this is no news. Agriculture is changing. There's no question about it. We are in a changing world. Do I like it? Not really. Do you like it? Probably not. Because as human beings, we get comfortable, right? We like to have our place. We like to, <clears throat> I would have preferred to not leave the family ranch. I would have preferred that everything stay together. But that's not the way it works. These, sometimes these things don't go into perpetuity. <clears throat> the people who are going to survive in our industry will be the ones who are the most adaptive to change, whether you like it or not. It's just a reality. So you can... You can buck that all you want to, but the reality is that unless you embrace it and learn to try to utilize it to your advantage, you're always going to be fighting it. This is interesting. We live in a society, think about this. We live in a society where people will no longer ever not have an answer to a question. And here's what that means to us in agriculture. It means that consumers are more educated than they have ever been. And you may be saying to yourself, yeah, but they're getting their news from the internet. So do you. You believe what you want to believe, right? Do we form our own perceptions on what we believe things to be? And those perceptions, of course, become our own realities. <clears throat> This is important to understand. Consumers understand more about what they put in their bodies than they ever have before. A lot of that, what they think they know, might be wrong. But here's what I'm going to tell you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can continue to fight it. But it doesn't matter if the information that they have is wrong. They're the consumer. How many of you ever heard the, the, the consumer or the customer's right? We've all heard it. Whether we want to admit it or not, we've all heard it. And it is imperative for us as ag producers to understand what consumers want. That's why I became involved in the organic industry. I don't know if organic food is better for you. I have no idea. I'd like to think that it is because that's my practice. But here's what I know. I know that in my side of production agriculture, I have a consumer base that exists that is willing to pay more for the same product. Why would I not take advantage of that? I'm a business person. It makes all the sense in the world. Do I want to pay three times for a box of cereal in the store because it's organic? No, but if someone else does, should I be the guy that supplies it? 
Absolutely. I want to take advantage of that. Does, it, does that work for everyone? Of course it doesn't. Will consumers, <clears throat> will consumers all go organic at some point? No. Will we be able to feed the world organically? Absolutely not. But there's that niche there. My point of the whole thing is, is that we have to do a better job as ag producers of understanding what the consumers want. How do we do that? We all get on the same page. We all communicate. We all develop relationships with people like Phil. Those relationships and that open communication build trust. And when we build trust and we, and we create a unified message in our industry, then we're providing the education for the consumers rather than the consumers self-educating themselves. We gotta do a better job at that. We're really great at talking to our own audience, right? We always talk about uh, people don't understand this and people don't understand that and look what we're fighting here and look what we're fight fighting there. But when's the last time that you talk to a consumer about what you do and why it's valuable, why it's important, why it matters to them? Because perception is reality. Remember the quiz? <clears throat> Here's my point with the quiz. Sometimes the answers are right in front of us and we can't see them. We read them like the old $10 bill and the new one, like the tiger and the lion. We read it. We develop our own perceptions about what we perceive things to be. And that becomes our reality. We need a perception and a reality check ourselves. It's super important. The answers sometimes are right in front of us, but we're so busy trying to overcomplicate things all the time that we forget that a lot of times the solutions are in the room where we are. That the answers are more simple than we think they are. So remember the picture I showed you of my fields blowing? A half a mile past those fields, this is what my farm really looks like. Does that change your perception of where I live? Relationships matter. Communication is imperative. And what you're left with at the end of the day is that trust is everything. And I think you all are extremely lucky to be able to live in this part of the country where you have a lot of great companies who are involved in agriculture. And one of them is Hendrix Trading Company. Someone that understands you as producers. They understand that Phil understood when he came to my farm and when he was trying to help me and when I thought he was just clowning around. Little did I know that Phil understood the model that in order for him to be successful, I have to be successful. You see, we're all really on the same page and we need to get behind that. So thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. For speaking here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Wow, that's great. Thank you guys very much. I got a present and it's heavy. So I'm thinking it might be gold or something like that, right? Maybe a bag of chickpeas. Uh, so I just wanted to say as well, um, I've got uh, my first book. My second book is going to be coming out fairly shortly. Um, if uh, anyone's interested in this, normally I sell these for $100 a piece, but are selling for $20 tonight. So uh, you're getting a really good deal tonight. Okay, so thank you guys.